كورات عزبتنا اذا كتري وصنحكم فيلم بقلطف نوصا بملا ام مبزحت اوك في العالمات كره تقايلو اتزعابي فنوي اب اوروبا ان امريكا ني تقايلو قال كابتن نزمه دبا زغربا اب امريكا زركبا عبيتنا اي تلفزيون تكالات كم اي بي سي سي بي اس اب كندا تي في اي اب فرنسا ار تي اف اب عاد انجليز بي بي سي كومون اب ايطاليا زركبا عبيتنا اي تلفزيون تكالات يا اذن اي دبدا فنوي ابو شتا حصير غزيم بقلط فن زتقايدو كوينو كساب حجي رخيبنا يبزلونا حبريتا مسرت كاب 8 مليون لعلي حزبي كم استعزبوي اتفنوي قصالي زلو ابو زحكرنا عطني عالم دما ابو صلوا يحضر الله كابت زقربه مدبات نتنا اي نفرت دبدا ابو دم سوع زملك طراي نبر نعبيت ناي تزكاي زلو كينا مجمار نبر هيوت ناي تا كتمان صعبينات ناي تدبدا بن زتقاللي نيرو كما راك قصد ما اب حارا مريتنا زب صحو صاتنيا كات قال مسكرناتهم هيبا اذا سئلت عزي بسفح مزرغوحو ني انتاي نسر عبدرك اب راس مغلاصو ناي قبي ستسفا سغمت مخانو دما اقاليو كاب زق قصيلنا اب حدا ني امريكا اب ناي تلفزيون تكال اي بي سي استباله امدب ناي تلاين زقربو سئلي كنرينا It is a war without mercy that has been raging for nearly 30 years. It threatens the lives of millions of people, but only rarely does the outside world get a glimpse of the struggle. Tonight, dramatic footage of the Ethiopian army's grim path of destruction through its rebellious northern province of Eritrea. A report from the front lines tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Relatively trivial stories close to home can be big news. Monumental stories far away from home go almost unnoticed. That has been the history of the war in Ethiopia. By any reasonable standard of humanity, it ought to be leading our television newscasts. It ought to be plastered across the front pages of our major newspapers and magazines. But the war and the suffering it has produced are like a silent scream. It doesn't disturb our tranquility because most of the time we neither hear it nor see what has produced it. A Canadian television documentary producer, Ivan Patry, has made it more difficult for us to claim that we could not know what is happening in Ethiopia. You're about to see and hear the face of war as you have rarely seen or heard it before. People are really devastated. I mean, life is suspended in Masawa. Fury is everywhere. Death is everywhere. You see the smell of it, the psychology of it. People going crazy in front of the camera, you know, because literally the pain has been too much. <laughs> To see a young kid completely devastated by shrapnel, talking to his brother and asking, this kid is, what, seven years old, asking him, you know, are they going to bury us right away? And the brother answering, no, we might be able to go to the hospital. I mean, it gives you, you know, an idea of the level of despair and the overwhelming presence of death among that population. <laughs> Napalm has been used quite extensively in Eritrea in the last years. In this shanty town, the Napalm completely devastated with two, two, two bombs. One morning, like a population of 500 people living in 
in cardboard houses, basically. Casualties that uh, we see here, there are burn case, Napal, and in areas of uh, Afabat, there is a, there was a cluster bomb, which explodes in the air and which has an extensive blast. Generally, the MiGs carry two of these cluster bombs. Every MiG has two, and they launch them quite low. Uh, of course, they used some demolishing bomb as well. And sometimes even uh, they have used rockets. But the most damaging was this cluster bombardment. This cluster bomb, it covers quite a wide area. It has very sharp shrapnels. And the shrapnels propel in a horizontal uh, way. So it can get people who are lying down on the, on the ground as well. There is no point in bombarding this town, except unless you want to kill children and women. That's the... So what do you think was the purpose? Why bombing specifically this? It was a shanty town. If you want to terrorize the population, too. the people do not know air raid. And he wants to make them, I mean, he wants to shock them. But at the same time, the Ethiopian government denies they have bombed. Yeah, I've heard through the radios that they have denied, but uh, I don't know whether they cry or laugh, I don't know. Besides unending war, both Eritreans and Ethiopians have had to deal with severe droughts and famine in the last five years. Since 1984, close to a million people have starved to death in this country except from shipments of food from the United States, like these bags of grain, the number would have been even higher. But food is also a weapon of war, is also a target for bombs. Bombs have destroyed many of these bags of wheat, but some were salvaged and brought into the mountains for distribution. But still, in these areas, five million people are still at risk. America Bianchi, America Nugus, America Haftam. America Mahirti. Na ana khamzi na ra et na sukku tablanna. Nugus na America na ana khamzi yegabranna. Man gusto khamzi bi ma nafarit kubda anna. When we come back, we'll talk with the journalist responsible for the remarkable video you've just seen, Canadian documentary producer Ivan Patry. Ivan Patry, who's in our New York studios, is a producer with the Canadian TV documentary company Alta Cine. He has been covering civil war and famine in Ethiopia on a series of assignments since 1984. His television crew was the only one to get pictures of the heavy fighting in Ethiopia during the past two months. And we will be looking at, at more of the video that you and your crew shot in a few minutes, Ivan. But I wonder if you would just help our audience understand a little bit who the players are and, and precisely where things now stand after 28, 29 years of war. Well, on one hand, you have the Ethiopian army, which is the largest and most important army of black Africa, 300,000 men. On the other hand, you have the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, which is uh, the rebel army who has fought for independence for the last 29 years. The war is rapidly unfolding in the last stages because the Ethiopian army has lost in the last two years, all the major battle that they have waged. So therefore, their only superior superiority, which is the Air Force, is being used on these massive air raids on the civilian population. This is what we have witnessed in April and May. Now, for the past 16 years, uh, Ethiopia has been a client state of the Soviet Union and has been closely advised and supplied by Eastern Europeans, most especially the East Germans. Uh, has any of that been changing in the last couple of years, and to what degree is that bringing about the changes that are taking place in Ethiopia now? Well, when you see the size of the warehouse in Ethiopia, and when, when you see the level of armament, of sophisticated weapons that are used, 
and by the interviews we have done also with engineers in the ports and all that, we, th th there seems to be a continuous uh, support, military support by the Soviet Union, new tanks, new T-55s, new artillery coming in regularly. So it's very, it's very difficult to monitor that exactly, but uh, the last reports by many different sources confirm that uh, the pipeline has not been cut. What is it then that causes people to believe that the regime of President Mengistu in Ethiopia may be nearing an end now? And as I ask that question, let me also ask you whether that is more likely to be a negotiated end or a violent end. Well, the war in Eritrea is only one of the wars that is now being waged inside Ethiopia as we know it. There are several other war fronts in Tigray, in the Oromos, which are being also waged by other resistant movements against the government. Ethiopia is the central front because 100,000 men are now in this front. But, I mean, other wars are being also waged. So the government, the central government of Addis Ababa, is in really in turmoil and is consider considerably weakened by all these wars and by the fact that 50% of, of its budget is going to the war front in a, in, in a country which has a severe drought. Now, what about the second half of my question? Do you think, therefore, that the end is going to be a negotiated end or is it likely to be a violent end? Well, people are fighting in all fronts. I mean, President Carter had tried a negotiated settlement which is, uh, has not uh, delivered up till now. And uh, basically with the two organizations, the Tigray Liberation Front and with the Eritrean Popular Liberation Front. And so what, uh, what do you think is likely to happen then? Well, basically if things keep on this way, I mean, you'll have a, a large scale uh, civilian massacre before uh, probably on one side the Eritreans will probably be able to take the last two cities that they don't control. And on the other hand, the Tigray Liberation Front is getting closer and closer to Addis Ababa every month. And explain to me what the role of the, of the Ethiopian Air Force is in all of this. Well, basically, uh, the only military superiority that the Ethiopians have at this stage are these MiG-21s and MiG-23s. So they raid systematically military areas and civilian areas attacking markets, attacking uh, bus stops, attacking schools on a very large scale. The Ethiopian army by military experts still has 60 to 80 MiGs left at its disposal. Is it your expectation that there are going to be a great many people still killed from the air? Well, if you look at what happened in Masawa and what you've just seen, uh, you can expect uh, a large scale uh, large skills operations in the, in the next two or three months. All right, we're going to take a break, Ivan. The, the army of the Ethiopian government, as we've just been discussing, seems to have been the loser in the bitter fighting this spring. When we come back, we'll look at the military consequences of its losses and the effect on its soldiers in the field. There was a key shift in strategic power in the Eritrean war when rebel forces captured the port of Masawa in February of this year. It is still in rebel hands today. Ivan Patry picks up his story with the battle for Masawa and its impact. Masawa is the central port of all Ethiopia. It's one of the major ports in Africa. And for the first 48 hours, it was very heavy shelling, heavy fighting. Several thousand people were killed. The fighting lasted three days. And they finally took the town completely, captured 8,000 POWs, prisoners of war, one of the central warehouses, Ethiopian army warehouses, had like 50 tanks in them. Well, the EPLF went in, took those tanks rapidly, and put them in action in the middle of the fighting, to the astonishment of the Ethiopian generals. All the Soviet arms were coming, was coming into the port of Masawa. So fuel, ammunition, food was all cut off through this operation. It's really an army getting more and more cornered on one hand and having very little willpower and very little morale. The army has almost uh, morally uh, has a decline and uh, they don't want to fight because there's an endless war for 28 years. So I think that has got. Certainly they have no motto in, because why they fight they don't know it. 
inside the Ethiopian army, people don't want to fight anymore. But among the civilian population inside Ethiopia, it's been a very unpopular war. People now have to give one month of their salary for the war effort. Rookies move from a schoolyard where they're conscripted by force to the front line inside two weeks. They get to these front lines. They don't know why they're fighting. They don't know who they're fighting. And they don't know how to fight. I was at the market with my mother. The soldiers rounded up all the young boys of our age and took us for the army. In the last three weeks, five operations on the Guinea front were completely unsuccessful. So therefore, you have hundreds and hundreds of bodies of Ethiopian soldiers in these trenches. And this, is, this has been the state of this war for in, the last, in the last year. The POWs are, are mostly forest conscripts, young people from peasant areas of Ethiopia. When you ask them, what do you want to do? They say, you want to go back home and, and work on the land. In the middle of a drought area, we saw a solitary tree. As we approached, we discovered several ammunition boxes. Inside the boxes, we found tens, dozens, hundreds of skulls of military uh, soldiers, Ethiopian soldiers. And basically, in the middle of this last tree of this drought area, it was astonishing to discover all this death, all this culture of death. Ethiopia is, at the present day, the poorest country in Africa and one of the poorest in the world. But 50% of its budget is going to this war effort in Eritrea. So on the one hand, you have the warehouse, the biggest warehouse in Africa, and on the other hand, you have millions of people dying by drought and famine every year. The basic pattern of the war for the last two years has been the following. The Ethiopian army has been losing ground on every front. But because of their superior air force, their only way of retaliating is hitting civilian targets in cities and in the countryside. Military man, against military man, then it's OK. That's justifiable. But hitting the civilians and the civilian targets by snap-and bomb and by uh, bombarding them, I think it's not justifiable. And that's inhuman. You see all this weaponry in the midst of drought, famine, massive civilian population being dislocated by war, people moving everywhere, nomads on camels going through uh, areas of cluster bombs, tank cemeteries everywhere, you know. So basically, life is going on, but on a so weak uh, lifeline. I mean, you just wonder how these people can still survive in these conditions. When we return, we'll be joined again by the man responsible for these pictures, Canadian documentary producer Ivan Patry. And joining us again now is documentary producer Ivan Patry. And I would like to make clear at this point that uh, Patry and Alto Cine, the group for which he works, uh, have engaged in a not-for-profit promotion of humanitarian mission to uh, Ethiopia. Is that where the money that is earned from whatever video you have shot here is going? Well, tonight's show is going for this effort, yes. Talk to me for a moment. We saw some scenes, Ivan, uh, at the very end of that last piece. Uh, of what looked like a family living in a, uh, almost like a sewer tunnel. What is that representative of? Well, exactly, the civilian population of Masawa, the, the port area we, we've seen earlier, uh, because of the aerial attacks, uh, go every morning from 6 till 7 at night under these small bridges, these causeways. It's the only protected area they have in that city. So they live there all day. This is why uh, an effort has to be done to evacuate the civilian population from Masawa. We're talking about 10 to 12,000 women and children at this stage. Who could, uh, who could take the responsibility of evacuating them? I mean, is, is there any effort underway to, to get them out of there? Well, basically, there are uh, non-governmental agencies working in this area. But, uh, you know, it's a huge operation because they need trucks, they need shelter, they need medical support, they need food also because uh, food will be, will be missing in this area quite soon because the drought is 
devastating other parts of Eritrea and Tigray. It is, it is a supreme irony when you talk about the scarcity of food because uh, you shot uh, an awful lot of video. Obviously, we could not show all of it, but one of the scenes that I have seen that was only very briefly represented in the pieces we showed tonight is literally of a volcano of grain. There is this huge, huge storage area, and maybe you can tell us about it a little, which was bombed and where there were thousands upon thousands of tons of grain we're, on fire. <clears throat> yeah, we're talking about more than 25,000 tons of grain on fire in Massawa after the February and April bombings. So this food is not available now for the needy population of Tigray or Eritrea. But beyond that, uh, the Ethiopian Air Force is now bombing markets, open markets, warehouses uh, in, in different villages to, uh, to try to really uh, uh, completely uh, overwhelm the, the population, put them in complete disarray. Give us a sense of what the international community is doing. I'm not speaking now about the relief efforts because indeed uh, the world really has responded with relief efforts. The food ironically is there and they can't get it into the interior of the country. Uh, but what is happening in terms of trying to bring about a ceasefire? What, what efforts are, are underway? Well, at this stage, very little is done. I mean, the, the major pressure and the first pressure has to be put on the Soviet Union so they will stop fueling and stop giving arms to this war. That, that hasn't been done. And up till now, the, the Soviet response has been very, very shallow and very quiet. This can, you, can you understand why that is, first of all? I mean, they, they have been donating, as I understand it, somewhere between 800 million and a billion dollars a year. They can ill afford it. Why, why is it so important to them? Well, basically, Ethiopia is a central country of the Horn of Africa. They had strategic interest in that area. The control of the Red Sea, the intelligence they gather from that control, all the uh, petrol and oil, and oil traffic going through there, was central for their for their African project several years ago, so they haven't they haven't backstepped from that since that moment. We have uh, less than a minute left, Ivan. Uh, what is the what is the season now in Ethiopia? Is it is it the rainy season coming up, and and what does that mean to? Well, the, the small people? rains have now started in in the highlands, which means that the relief operation will be considerably handicapped in parts of Eritrea and in also in Tigray, which is a very severe drought-stricken province uh, south of Eritrea. So therefore, five million people are at risk of dying because food won't be able to reach them because of the war and because of the, uh, of this, uh, of the rainy season. Ivan Patry, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Soviet President Gorbachev is due to arrive here in Washington at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow for his summit meeting with President Bush. There'll be a summit preview on tomorrow's edition of Good Morning America and full coverage of Gorbachev's arrival and the latest summit developments on World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. The rainy season is due soon in Ethiopia, and with it, what could be a climatic battle in the world's longest-running civil war. Rebel factions have wiped out thousands of government troops in recent months, and they now have the army surrounded in the breakaway province of Eritrea. CBS News has obtained new pictures from what U.S. officials describe as the world's most destructive battleground. Edie Magnus narrates this report. These are the killing streets of Ethiopia's civil war. <laughs> Government MiGs have repeatedly bombed the rebel control port of Massawa in Eritrea over the past two months. The timing of this one was particularly vicious. It was just after dusk when people thought it was safe to be on the streets. There is no point in bombarding this town except unless you want to kill children and women, that's it. One frightened boy asks if someone will be coming to bury him. The Ethiopian government has denied reports that these attacks are taking place. From the country where images of famine-stricken peasants seared the world's conscience five years ago, now there are images of civilian slaughter. 
The most seriously wounded are piled in trucks and driven for as long as 30 hours to primitive hospitals with little sanitation and no painkillers, where there are always swarms of flies and always sounds of pain. In one room are the victims of napalm burns. There was a... The Ethiopian Air Force planes came in flying low, he says, killing his daughter. In another room are those hit by cluster bombs. 12-year-old Mahmoud had his leg nearly severed at the knee. In addition to destroying lives, the bombs are destroying food. Tons of it lie buried and smoldering in the rubble. The Masawa port on the Red Sea is a critical entry point for international food shipments intended for as many as five million people throughout Ethiopia in danger of starvation. With the port destroyed, the only other viable supply route is through neighboring Sudan. But people fear the convoys will bring too little too late. It's awful to think of food lying in places and not able to arrive to the people. Sister Bernadette treats the malnourished in the province of Tigray. This man walked for eight hours carrying his nine-month-old son to get help. And dozens more need treatment, suffering dysentery, scabies, even typhoid. Nearby, a desperate woman searches for wild grass seeds for her family, the last step before starvation. Perhaps the most haunting symbol of the chaos lies hidden on the site of a former government military base in Misawa, ammunition boxes filled with skeletal remains. No one knows whose. Ethiopia is a place where the silence is deafening. And where a cry for help seems a cry that no one will hear. Edie Magnus, CBS News, New York. For the first time in a long time, pictures of a war which has been fought largely out of sight. For the first time in a long time, pictures of a war which has been fought largely out of sight in Ethiopia. We have seen the devastation of famine on the people there. These pictures taken by a freelance Canadian photographer show the equally devastating effects of civil war. ABC's Karen Burns, who's visited Ethiopia numerous times, put this report together. This is the aftermath of a cluster bomb attack. Cluster bombs explode horizontally and are designed only to injure people. They have allegedly been sold to the Ethiopian government by the Israelis, a charge that the Israelis deny. They are used by the Ethiopian government against its own citizens. There is no point in bombarding this town except unless you want to kill children and women. The most recent battle here in Masawa, a key port city attacked by the Ethiopian government trying to dislodge Eritrean rebels who hold the port. Here in the north, in the province of Eritrea, rebels have been fighting for 30 years to gain their independence from the Ethiopian government. Over the years, the rebels have evolved from a highly trained force into one that many believe is now winning the war. The Ethiopian government is getting desperate. There are now 35,000 Ethiopian prisoners of war. This captured Ethiopian general says that the Eritrean pressure may yet break the back of the Ethiopian government. And I don't think the central government can handle it anymore, unless and otherwise they start the negotiation very soon. The war is almost being over now. A State Department official called this war possibly the largest and most destructive conflict in the world today. We have seen Ethiopia's famine. Now we are seeing Ethiopia's genocide. Karen Burns, ABC News. Des ruines, des blessés, des morts. Le lot d'une ville touchée de plein fouet par la guerre. Massawa, ville côtière de l'Érythrée sur la mer Rouge, a été bombardée par l'aviation éthiopienne. Une cible de plus d'une guerre oubliée. Massawa a été bombardée parce que un mois auparavant, 
elle avait été conquise par le Front de Libération Populaire de l'Érythrée. Et pourtant, après la bataille, la ville vivait un calme relatif. La population remettait de l'ordre et fêtait les vainqueurs. Elle avait presque oublié que c'était la guerre, qu'elle durait depuis près de 30 ans et que l'armée éthiopienne allait répliquer. Début avril, après le départ des forces du Front de Libération, des MIG survolent la ville et lâchent leurs bombes sur la population, faisant de nombreuses victimes. There is a, there was a cluster bomb which explodes in the air and which has an extensive blast which covers wide area. Des bombes fournies par l'URSS et peut-être par la Libye pour le napalm et Israël pour celle à fragmentation. En quelques jours, au moins 90 morts et 200 blessés. Une guerre oubliée. Une guerre dont le gouvernement éthiopien tente de cacher les horreurs, niant même que les bombardements d'avril aient eu lieu. Un mensonge éhonté de dire M. Goshu de la délégation éthiopienne à l'ONU. Pourquoi détruire Massawa, d'expliquer M. Goshu Ce sont les Éthiopiens qui l'ont construite. Les gens qui vivent dans la ville ont, eux, une explication. Et ils ont peur. Une guerre oubliée, tant dans le monde qu'à l'intérieur de l'Éthiopie. Il n'est pas bon temps de parler de ça dans la capitale Addis Abeba, comme l'explique ce travailleur éthiopien blessé pendant l'attaque alors qu'il se trouvait dans son hôtel. Well, one could go to jail for speaking about these things. It's, it's happened many times. I know of cases. Yeah. You can't say what you want to say. No. Un silence qui n'est rompu sur place que par le bruit des armes, des combats, des bombardements et le cri des blessés, des civils naturellement, des enfants en particulier. <coughs> <coughs> 